Hey, good morning, Emmanuel family. Welcome if you're online, if you're in person. Uh, when I was at the gym a few weeks ago, I had just gotten off a piece of exercise equipment and a person who knew I was a pastor came up to me and said, can I talk to you for a moment? And so here I am just drenched, you know, in sweat, but we stepped off to the side. And this person poured out their heart about a recent family fracture. Uh, he said he had said something hurtful to one of his family members, didn't say whether it was his wife or whether it was one of his children or whoever, but um, now they were disconnected. It was a family fracture. And he tried to apologize, but the other family member isn't speaking to him, won't return his phone calls, won't return his texts. He's written a few things, just it's kind of like a complete cutoff. And my friend was heartbroken. Um, just, just asked me, you know, what can I do? Um, they were even at the point where they were apologizing for things they do wrong. They were just trying to apologize for the sake of apologizing to start a conversation that hopefully led to reconciliation. So we talked for a while, and I, I felt like, you know, I, I gave some helpful thoughts. Um, we prayed. Family. The Bible is very clear in saying that families are a gift from God. Psalm 68, 6 says, God sets the lonely in families. Proverbs 17, 17 says that relatives are born to help in times of adversity. And then Proverbs 127, 3 says that children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Few things bring us more joy and fulfillment than family until they don't. Now there's a couple things we need to remember about families. Families are the number one thing that God uses to shape us. Your attitudes, your perspective in life, the way that you talk, the way that you laugh, where did that come from? It came from your family of origin. Your family is also the number one thing that Satan uses to wound you. If he can wound you early through a divorce, some sort of rejection, through an abuse, through a lack of stability in your home, if, if Satan can plant a lie inside of you when you're young, he'll try to manipulate you the rest of your life. That's why uh, Emmanuel has made ministry to families and singles with children and teens their number one priority. Because we know that if children and teens can be introduced to Jesus and have a meaningful relationship with Jesus, that no matter what goes on in their life moving forward, they'll always have a Savior who loves them, who cares for them, and will help them to walk through whatever woundedness they have. There's something else you need to know about families. Families are not perfect. Which brings us to our text this morning from Genesis chapter 42, verses 6 through 9. We do not need to look any further than the Bible to see that families are very imperfect. But here's the good news. Just because your family isn't perfect doesn't mean that God can't use you. Because God uses all kinds of dysfunctional families in the Bible to still accomplish his will, while at the same time trying to move these families toward healing, reconciliation, and forgiveness. So please go in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 42, verses 6 through 9. Um, it's up on the screen if you need to read along. Here's the scripture. Since Joseph was governor of all Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was to him that his brothers came. When they arrived, they bowed before him with their faces to the ground. Now Joseph recognized his brothers instantly, but he pretended to be a stranger, and he spoke harshly to them. Where are you from, he demanded. Well, we're from the land of Canaan, they replied. We have come to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. And he remembered the dreams that he'd had about them many years before. 
Now, Joseph grew up in what we would call a highly dysfunctional family. His father, Jacob, married a woman he didn't love so he could marry one he did. That's messed up. The two women he married were sisters. Why don't you just take a match and toss it into a pile of gasoline-soaked rags? The first sister was named Leah, and she was a baby-making machine. I mean, she was fertile. And she gave Jacob many sons. The second sister was named Rachel, and Rachel was barren. And she watched through the years helplessly as Leah was just giving birth time and again, and she was barren. But Jacob was not content with the size of his family, so he slept with an assortment of handmaidens and concubines who just kept having babies. Rachel, after a number of years, finally did give birth to Joseph who immediately became Jacob's favorite. But later she died giving birth to the second child, whom they named Benjamin. Jacob coped with the loss of his beloved Rachel by checking out. You know what an absentee father is? Someone who is there but not there. Jacob left the boys to do whatever they wanted to, and as a result, they grew up to become angry men who sold their father's favorite son into slavery and then came home and lied about it and said that he was actually dead. He'd been killed by a wild animal. Now, I want you to fast forward 22 years, and Joseph is now 39 years old, and he's been the prime minister of of Egypt for nine years. One day he's working with a number of vendors and he's selling grain and he hears a distinctive language with a very distinctive dialect and he knows. His brothers have come to buy grain. He recognizes their voices. He knew they would come. Now, over the course of the next four chapters from Genesis 42 to Genesis 45, we get a front row seat on how a fractured, dysfunctional family is healed and restored to love and to trust. Now, to be sure, they are not a perfect family, because remember, there's no perfect families. But they are a family in which genuine warmth and healing has returned. And listen, it's all because of Joseph. So what did Joseph do to heal his family system, to fix it? But more importantly, what can you and I do to fix the brokenness within our own family, whether it's your family of origin or your extended family? Because remember, everybody's broke in some way, shape, or form. And every family has imperfections. So what can you do based on Joseph's life under his leadership of the Holy Spirit? Number one, trust that God is working behind the scenes to fix your family, even if you can't see it. I'm reminded of the book of Esther. You remember that book in the Bible in the Old Testament? The word God is never used once in the book of Esther, but God is all over it because God is working behind the scenes, shaping events. That's exactly what's going on here in this passage of Scripture. Initially, Joseph was not open to reconciliation. Remember what he named his firstborn son? Manasseh. God has made me forget my father's family. That's an indirect way of saying God's made me forget my brothers who'd done me wrong. Joseph did not want to face his past. As prime minister, think about this. It was a new thought to me this week. As prime minister, he could have gotten in a chariot and rode back to Canaan any time he wanted to and seen his dad. Can you imagine in those nine years when he's prime minister, he could have just raised up hundreds of people to go with him and showing up at his father's doorstep. Hey, I'm back. But he didn't. 
Let sleeping dogs lie. That's why verse 9 is so important. Verse 9 says, He remembered the dreams he'd had about them many years before. Even though Joseph didn't want to face his family hurts, God reminded Joseph, I chose you to save your own family. The very people who have done you wrong and hurt you so badly, you are going to be their salvation. But Joseph was not alone in the restoration process. God was working in the lives of Joseph's ten brothers as well. For example, while in Joseph's presence, not knowing it was him, their brothers said to one another, verse 21, clearly we are being punished because of what we did to Joseph long ago. We saw his anguish when he pleaded for his life, but we wouldn't listen. That's why we're in trouble. In other words, what they had done to Joseph many years before had been eating away at them. They hadn't seen Joseph in 22 years, but they saw him every day. Some of you haven't spoken to relatives in years, but you still see them every day. They're with you. The weight of their sin, the sound of Joseph's pleading, was a deafening sound in their ears. God was using that sound over 22 years to soften their hearts and get them ready for reconciliation. Why? Because God doesn't leave sleeping dogs lie. We serve a healing God and a God whose main priority is reconciliation of relationships. That's why he sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, that we may be reconciled to God. He is committed to fixing what is broken in your family, whether it is a strained marriage whether it is a difficulty with a child, whether it is an abusive past, whatever it is. So, here's the point. Have some trust that God is working behind the scenes to fix what's broken in your family. Have some trust that God is working behind the scenes to fix what's broken in your marriage. Have some trust that God is working behind the scenes that he is working in that child who is going astray at this moment. Trust that God is sovereign and he's working all around you and he's talking to your spouse about what they should be doing and you don't need to be talking to your spouse about what they ought to be doing. How many of you discovered you got to be married like six hours to figure out you can't talk to your spouse about what they need fixing? You know what I'm saying? It's better to just pray about it, leave it to God, and if you see an open door, just say, well, I've been thinking. But, you know, if you go direct in and tell, so, you tell your spouse what they ought to be changing in their life, that ain't going to go well for you. So take a step back, pray about it, and allow God to do the behind-the-scenes work. It took 22 years for God to bring Joseph and his brothers to a place of healing. Be patient. Give God space to work. Trust his timing. Joseph trusted that God was working behind the scenes to fix his family problems. Number two, open your heart to forgiveness and reconciliation. Verse 7 says, Joseph recognized his brothers instantly, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Okay, so what's up with Joseph speaking harshly to his brothers? I think there's a couple reasons. One is forgiveness is always an uneven process mixed with a lot of pain and emotion. Can we just allow Joseph to be human for a moment? He hasn't seen his brothers in 22 years and the last time he did, they had murder on their minds. He's in self-protection mode. He knows why they're here and he knows what he's supposed to do but that doesn't make it any easier. What he has tried to forget has been ripped off and he's bleeding all over again. He's in self-protection mode. But there's another reason why Joseph spoke harshly to his brothers. He's testing them. Have his brothers really changed? They're now middle-aged men with graying hair, with a waistline that's expanding. What about their character? Has their character changed 
So you know what he does? He cooks up an elaborate scheme. Here it is. He throws them all into prison for three days. How's that for being direct? Yeah, you guys, you're all spies. Off with your heads. For three days, he throws them in prison. At the end of three days, he takes them out of prison and then says to them, okay, um, you guys can all go home, but um, somebody's got to stay here because um, I want to see the younger brother that you were talking about. This, this guy, what, what was his name again? Uh, uh, Benjamin. I want, him to, I want him to come the next time you guys come. Well, the brothers go back to Canaan, but Simeon, one of the brothers, stays behind. While they are returning from Egypt to Canaan, they go into their grain sacks and realize that mysteriously, somehow, all of the money that they had given to purchase the grain is back in their sacks, and they go, oh, great, what's going on with this? So they go back to their father, and they say, Father, we've got this grain, and, and somehow there must have been an accounting mistake, and somebody should have taken the silver, but they didn't take the silver. We have the silver, and oh, by the way, you know, he wants to see Benjamin. Well, guess what? Jacob does a freak-out moment. Because, remember, Jacob only loved one woman, and that was Rachel, and she's dead. And Rachel had two sons, Joseph and Benjamin, and Joseph is now gone, and, and he is not. I mean, you talk about a helicopter parent. He's keeping Benjamin right next to him. Some months go by. The grain reserves go down. Jacob says to the boys, hey, go back to, to Egypt and get some grain. And they say, Dad, we're happy to do that, but just remember, we're supposed to bring Benjamin. I don't want you to bring Benjamin. You ever have a sickly conversation in your family? Right? It's, it's, that's what's going on. Well, go back and get grain. Okay, we'll be glad to go back and get grain, but we, you know, we got to take Benjamin. You can't take Benjamin. Well, we can't go back and get grain if, if we don't have Benjamin. Okay, fine. So Jacob allows Benjamin to go back, and they stand before Joseph again, and the brothers say, look, we have no idea what happened, but the last time we got grain, you know, we, we, the, our silver ended up in our sack, and so here's the payment for the last time we got grain, and oh, by the way, here's more payment for this next shipment of grain that we're going to get, and oh, by the way, here's Ben. Joseph throws this luncheon. That must have been weird for the brothers. Last time we saw you, you threw us in prison. Now you're, you know, now you're throwing a party for us, right? Forgiveness is uneven. So Joseph throws this party, this luncheon for his brothers, and mysteriously he seats his brothers in perfect birth order. And then when Benjamin sits down, Joseph orders the servants to pile five times the amount of food onto Benjamin's plate that everybody else has gotten. And the brothers are stunned. They sit there, they say nothing, but they're like, doo -doo 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 -doo. I mean, it's just weird. Finally, after lunch, Joseph says, you can go back home. And so they're on their way back with the grain, but Joseph, unknowingly to the brothers, hides his silver cup in Benjamin's sack. And then he sends a group of army people to go and confront the brothers. And the brothers, you know, high and mighty, say, don't be ridiculous. We're men of integrity. I mean, we even brought back the silver from the last time you guys messed it up. So we will, whoever has the silver cup in his sack will go back to Egypt and be thrown in prison. Guess what? Benjamin, it's there. The brothers freak out. How could this have happened? Benjamin, how could you have done this? I didn't do it. They all go back to Egypt. They stand before <clears throat> Joseph and Joseph really gives them the riot act. And ironically, Judah, one of the brothers, says to Joseph, look, you're going to break our father's heart. We promised that Benjamin would come back under any circumstance. Here's the deal. You allow Benjamin to go back. I will be your slave, and I will be the one that goes into prison. Now, there's a whole backstory behind that. Read Genesis chapter 38. Because Judah, in the last 22 years, has gotten his comeuppance because of his own deceit, and he's got the royal smackdown from God. Judah is now a different man, and he has put himself in harm's way to save 
Benjamin. Well, it's at that point that Joseph can't take it any longer, and he breaks down, and he bawls, he cries so, he cries so loud that all of the servants in Pharaoh's household realize what's going on. They're like, uh-oh, it's a meltdown moment. And Joseph reveals himself for who he really is. And there's family reconciliation. So, why is it so important that Joseph tested them? Listen to this. Because when you're fixing family problems, you need to distinguish between forgiveness and the rebuilding of trust. They are two different things. Never confuse them. We are to, ref- we are to forgive people. Colossians 3.13 says, Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anybody who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. In other words, if you're a Christian, forgiveness is a command. You just can't, you can't say, no, I'm not going to forgive you. You can't say in your heart, they've hurt me too deeply. I'm not going to forgive them. Or I'll forgive them in 10 years. No, nope. your lack of forgiveness says something more about you than it does the person who has hurt you. You know why? Because of all that the Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven you of. See, sometimes we forget that. We're ledger players, right? We just keep a ledger, the people who have hurt us, and then we go, whoa, they've hurt us way too much. I can't forgive them. No, nope. forgiveness is a choice. We need to make that choice because we're followers of Jesus Christ. But forgiveness is free, but trust is earned. What does that mean? It means that before Joseph was going to let his brothers back into his life, he was creating a a set of opportunities for his brothers to earn back his trust. I cannot tell you how many times through the years I have had women say to me, but he told me he loves me and things will be different this time. Okay, so how has he proven he is different and over how long a period of time? Do you know that Joseph set up this series of opportunities to rebuild trust with his brothers? It took over a year for all of these opportunities to come into play. Make sure that your heart is open to forgiveness and reconciliation. Listen, Proverbs says, above all else, guard your heart. In other words, do not become a hardened person. When people hurt you, when people reject you, even people that seek out to destroy you, we are to guard our heart to make sure that we are soft, that we keep ourselves pliable. But that doesn't mean you let those people back into your life until they have proven their trustworthiness. Forgiveness is free. Trust is earned. Grace is when you create opportunities for people to show that they have changed. Joseph's process of testing his brothers came from his heart, his desire for forgiveness and reconciliation. Three, it stops with me. Create a new trajectory for your family. Genesis 45, 7 and 8 says, God sent me ahead to pave the way to make sure that there was a remnant in the land to save your lives in an amazing act of deliverance. So you see, it wasn't you who sent me, but God. God set me in a place as father over Pharaoh, put me in charge of his personal affairs, and made me ruler of all Egypt. Joseph made a decision that his family dysfunction, the generational patterns of lying and deceit and cutoff would stop with him and that he was going to create a new, whole new trajectory for the family system moving forward. Listen to this. If you want to fix your family problems, you have to start with you. Even if you don't think you're the one primarily responsible for your family problems. Remember, Joseph was not primarily responsible for his family problems. His father was. But Joseph was an arrogant 17-year-old that kept lording over the fact that he had dreams and that one day that he would be lord over his own family system. That didn't set well, right? So here's the thing. No family is perfect. Therefore, you may not be the primary person responsible for your family dysfunction, but you still need to take a step back and think, what are some things that I'm doing that contribute to my family dysfunction? And then say to yourself, I'm going to stop it in my generation. 
The only person you can change in your marriage is you. The only person you can change in your entire family system is you. You can't change your spouse. You can't change your children. You can't change your mom and dad. But you can change you. And that's all God is asking for you to do. So how do you create a positive trajectory for your family moving forward? How do you move beyond dysfunction and create a whole new trajectory? A couple things. We've already looked at a few, like being open to forgiveness and reconciliation by creating opportunities for um, trust to be rebuilt, by taking responsibility for your own actions. What are some other traits that I see in Joseph? Here's one. Take the high road in conflict. Now, I'm going to talk about that next week, but just, just take it for what it is right at this moment. Do you know that when somebody does wrong to you, there's always a tendency to slap back? When somebody says something unkind to you, there's always a tendency to say something unkind back to them. When somebody wounds you, there's always a tendency to wound them back. You know what I see in Joseph? Joseph took the high road. He was profoundly gracious. He did not give to his brothers what they deserved. He gave them grace. How about this one? You want to change your family trajectory? Consider this. Ask yourself the question, what behaviors and attitudes do I need to stop to ensure that I do not pass them on to the next generation. Do you come from a long line of people with a critical spirit? You're going to have to make a decision. It stops with me. I will stop having a critical spirit like my mom, my dad, my family system, whoever, and I'm going to intentionally say it stops with me. Do you, has alcohol negatively impacted your family system? You need to take steps to stop it. I've said this publicly many times. Both sides of my family system were alcoholics. When my parents got saved, they said, no more alcohol in the home. And they stopped that generational cycle of alcoholism. My mom and dad, that's it. It stops with us. And they gave my sister and I a great example of what it looks like to not grow up with the drunk family system. Three, were you abused as a child? You need to take steps to receive a healing because, you know, sometimes, to be honest with you, people who have been abused sometimes become abusers. The very same patterns that people use to hurt you, you end up hurting other people with. We need to stop that. Here's one more thing. If you want to have a positive trajectory change in your family system, be all in with Jesus Christ. The greatest gift you can give your family system right now and in the future is to be a follower of Jesus Christ completely. To be a spiritually healthy you. Your family will follow you when they see your integrity, that you are worthy of being followed. We call this integrity Christ-likeness. So I want to close by just um, asking you a couple questions. Just kind of taking everything in the last few moments and bringing it down to a few questions. Number one, are there some people in your family system that you're really struggling with right now? And are you open to forgiving them and reconciling? Are there some family members that you haven't spoken to in months or years? And have you, listen, listen, have you done your part? Right? Have you done your part to seek reconciliation? Remember, the Apostle Paul says, as far as it's up to you, live at peace among all men. In other words, there are some people that you're never going to be at peace with. Yes, because of life, it's a ragged edge. And there are some divorces, you know, that are just, they're not speaking to each other. And that may be a healthy thing only because that other person is so toxic that they refuse reconciliation and forgiveness. We live in the real world, but as it's up to you, do you have a soft heart and are you open to reconciliation? Can you take a hard look right now and maybe the rest of the afternoon and say, are there patterns that I am exhibiting that I got from my own family system or picked up along the way that are destructive and will you make a decision that it stops with you and the best gift you can give your family moving forward 
is letting go of those dysfunctional generational sin patterns. And then lastly, are you really all in with Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about dating Jesus. I'm talking about marrying Jesus. I'm not talking about calling out to Jesus when you're in trouble and then putting him on a shelf someplace. I'm talking about day in, day out, following the Lord Jesus Christ with great intentionality, with a high purpose, and saying, I'm in. I'm I'm literally all in for the rest of my life. That is the greatest gift you can give your family. Let's bow our heads together. Lord Jesus, um, you know, we're going to get through this. And this today is family dysfunction. And thank you for Joseph's example. We are living in a moment of great fracture. I, I've, I've heard more stories than I care to admit about family members saying, if you vote for him, we're not talking anymore. And I just shake my head. You never designed it this way. So God, for those listening online, for those in the room right now, bring a healing. Bring an open spirit of forgiveness and reconciliation. Can, give, give us the ability to trust you that you're working behind the scenes and we, we don't even see that you're working, but we just know it. And help us to be patient. And God, some of us today need to make a decision very clearly. It stops with me. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not thinking this way anymore because it's killing me and I don't want it to affect anybody else in my family. God, give us that kind of courage today. Let a Joseph rise up in us to save a next generation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.